Ladies and gentlemen, it's a quick pleasure, a quick pleasure for me to be here to uh, host this first panel discussion on Asia economic outlook. Quite an uh, exciting morning to be in Bandung. It's a short drive from Washington City, but it's worth the drive. It's a uh, beautiful weather. But um, today we have a very distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, many people are traveling from around the world, and uh, and I, I have the pleasure to put together this list of questions and challenges. This lady and gentleman to talk about the future of, of Asia and how it, uh, ASEAN driving Asia's economic. So I just want to do a, a quick uh, introduction um, on the names and the company, and I'll let them do. A brief moment, uh, 60 seconds, introduce what, what these organizations do to give the background uh, for the audience. Uh, Ms. Mokdami, Chief Executive Officer of Savicom in Vietnam. And then uh, Mr. Dongwon is a, a, a founding partner, Chief Executive of Vina Capital, one of the leading investment firms in Vietnam and pioneering a lot of different concepts here. Uh, Mike Liu, the President and uh, um, of KSI's Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific, it's come from Malaysia. Uh, Mr. Wang Long, Executive Director, Institute for Global Cooperation and Understanding from Peking University in China. And last but not least, uh, quite important gentleman, John Chen, Chairman and co founder of the Intelligent Community Forum coming from uh, Canada. And before we start, I just want to say congratulations for the great work that the uh, uh, leadership at the New Province. Uh, they have done for the last couple of years and deserve the distinguished award from the uh, Intelligent Community um, Forum. So, congratulations. So, maybe let's start with, with uh, the lady. Uh, maybe 60 seconds to, to explain briefly about your company and your expertise. Thank you, Mr. Kuo. And um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really my honor to be here today to uh, share with you uh, our visit on the um, Asian Economic Outlook. And I feel very good vibe here today. Um, I was here last year and wanted to come back. Had a lot of change and a lot of things discussed. So a little bit about me. Um, ben Dan, a founder of Savicom. We are a software uh, consulting company. We provide software development service to clients uh, from more than 20 countries in the world. And currently, we have more than 700 employees working on the software uh, digital transformation project. And I'm also placed as Vice President of uh, Vietnam Digital Technology Alliance in Vietnam, which we, we are going together to promote Vietnam IT, IT business and landscape in Vietnam. And we are very happy to be here today to discuss with you how, um, what is uh, really uh, what we are here today and um, what we need to do in the, in the future together. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Delma. Good morning. Uh, well, Vina Capital uh, is one of the largest uh, investment firm in Vietnam. Uh, we manage about $4 billion, but our total investment in Vietnam is close to $10 million now. Uh, half the money, about 50 percent, is in the capital market. We mainly invest in uh, uh, private companies in Vietnam, helping to grow. The other half of the fund, we invest mainly in a new sector that we are very uh, passionate about, which is the clean energy sector. So we have about over a million dollars at the moment investing mostly renewable energy, uh, LNG to power uh, space. Uh, we also invest in uh, technology startup something called Vini Capital Venture, which is the uh, since 18 years now in this space. So I'm happy to say that this is our 20th anniversary, so we've been established about 20 years ago. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, Michael? Hi. Uh, moderator Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Our KSS Strategic Institute for Asia Pacific is a leading regional think tank uh, that focuses on regional economic integration, public policy, as well as of promoting sustainable growth. In addition to that, I'm also chairman of the ASEAN Economic Club, which was launched by the chairman of ASEAN last year in Phnom Penh, 
and I'm also president of the World Digital Chamber and was also recently set up to promote digital transformation and digital inclusiveness. So with these three organizations, we hope to contribute to a better and more sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wango. Good morning. Uh, it is uh, great to be back to Vietnam and then back to uh, Vietnam. And first of all, I'd like to uh, particularly thank Frank for inviting me to speak at this plenary uh, on the issue of economic development so that I can pretend to be an economist. Um, uh, quickly about my institute. Uh, my institute is to for global and cooperation. And, and I understand that the university is a leading China based think tank that includes cutting edge academic and policy researchers, and we also provide uh, policy advice to, uh, uh, to our government on various of, uh, of issues important to, uh, 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 to uh, China and the uh, world. Uh, we, our mission is to is uh, connecting people and understanding the world. So we do firmly believe that in, in this uh, highly globalized world, uh, people to people Exchanges of ties are particularly important, and so there's no nothing can replace really replace this kind of face to face uh, exchanges uh, among us. So uh, it is my great pleasure and honor, and again to uh, to be part of this uh, policy institution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Dong. John Chu. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Um, on that note, with a lot of the work that we've done, and uh, we've seen most recent uh, political and economic changes around the world, mostly the trade tensions, the, the, the post uh, COVID recovery, uh, the unfortunate recent attack of Hamas on Israel, and, and the trade war, uh, and the war between Russia and Ukraine. Lots of things happening, but the IMF still forecasted that. Um, uh, the region's growth is on track to play two thirds uh, of, of the world's GDP. But these growth are not very sustainable when we looked at them. However, so that the global landscape is shifting quite significantly, but Asia is continuing to rise. What, what do you see as an impact on Asia that might make that being interrupted and not being sustainable? John. The, uh, the issue in global trade is that uh, peace comes as a result of trade. And what we need to see is uh, more conversation and connectivity among cities, regions around the world. The cities that uh, we work with, from the United States, and uh, now here in Vietnam, but also 
also in other parts of, of Asia, uh, we have seen that they have the ability to continue to connect, to continue that aspect of trade. Uh, so as long as they are trading, there's peace. When we see that uh, communities are not connecting and they are not fulfilling their objectives of peace, I don't know trade. And there, that's a very uh, important piece of the puzzle that we're looking at. You see this uh, difficulty in, in, in Europe and particularly in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, uh, where we are not seeing things evolve. It's going to continue to go on for many years. And the opportunities then are for places like in Asia to take advantage of leverage the opportunities of trade and peace as long as that can be understood. Uh, a little concerned about the issues that, that take place with China and Taiwan, of course. Uh, but uh, what we need to do is keep that leverage of conversation. So, what do you think about it? Well, you know, the uh, last few years, you've got the trade tension, you've got the post-COVID, then you've got the war uh, going on, and things a lot of challenges globally. But I think coming all these challenges, uh, if you look at from an ASEAN perspective, as we call ASEAN economic, and Vietnam perspective, I think Vietnam have uh, benefited from some of these uh, trade tension. Uh, you look at from since 2018, uh, U.S. import uh, from China dropped about 10 percent, but Vietnam actually increased by about 7 percent. Uh, that's mainly because all the manufacturing is moving uh, toward Vietnam or diversifying uh, post-COVID. So first issue is is uh, Vietnam will benefit uh, somewhat from this trade tension. The other country in ASEAN, Thailand, uh, increased by about 2 percent or so from this trade tension. People talk about India as well, but I think India it's mainly people moving the factory, uh, focusing on the domestic economy of India rather than export, uh, because the market is so large. Uh, so that's on the trade side. Uh, and on the post-COVID, I think that story is, is almost finished now, uh, mainly because you know, uh, by 2024, the impact of COVID is no longer uh, impacted the economy. However, uh, it does impact on the tourism sector, because uh, this year, we expect a lot of tourism arrival in Vietnam and China, but that's not happening. Uh, Pre-COVID uh, travel, the GDP is about 10% of Vietnam and 15% of Thailand. But most of the Chinese uh, travel are now doing more domestic, uh, they're not doing international, so that's have a little bit of impact on our economy. But in terms of the Ukraine and Russia uh, conflict, I think that's just driven more China and uh, Russia closer to trade relationship and more trading in revenues and US dollars. So those are the it's interesting to see, you mentioned the tourism industry um, in Vietnam alone, but also other countries being impacted because of uh, the, the slew of Chinese tourism and Russian tourism. But let's, let's, go to, let's go back to China, it's trying to reopen its economy. It's not quite exciting for other countries, right? If we look at Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, um, all the countries that are here, uh, supply chain, but some countries are in talks on, I guess, the concept of French shoring that's moving to a neighboring country or, or, uh, or bringing back production to a country. But the cost of bringing back to production, uh, production to a country is more significant than French shoring. Um, what, what is your thought on that? And what are the countries that are being impacted and what should they do to? Consider these two options. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I think uh, in your, uh, this question actually also somewhat related to your first question as well. Um, first of all, I'd like to say opening it up really is key. Because China perhaps is uh, one of the, the few countries in the world that really define. We have written this into all the documents, right? All the, the, the constitutions. You know, or that open up as one of the main guiding principles of the whole nation of China. Uh, 
China's national development. Um, and China's insist on opening up now we call it a high level uh, uh, to the outside world. Uh, actually, it's a very important time for us uh, to um, in promoting what I call the reorganization. We talk about a lot of the challenges uh, you know, facing us, including trade tensions, geopolitical uh, um, confrontation, uh, etc. Uh, but my firm belief is that globalization has not come to an end. Rather, it entered into a new stage. I create a label I call the reglobalization process. And uh, ASEAN, China, ASEAN China, all of us. We have to adapt to this uh, renormalization process. Um, and coming out of uh, COVID, uh, China is also recovering. Uh, uh, as the region, but the world, uh, as you are also already, I think the recovery process still, uh, uh, I think we still kind of want right, to a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, risks. So one of those risks is uh, what Pursuing that uh, policy uh, in the past couple of years, but current by administration, they said, well, no, they want to show this so called deep risky. But many people actually suspicious whether or not deep risky is just a decoupling in these guys. Um, so, so that's a very important, I think, what we need to do is instead of decoupling, we should pursue what I call the uh, on the basis of um, uh, reciprocity. Um, and, uh, and I believe this is what happening now. Uh, so you quote the data from MBF uh, in your in the introductory remarks. I also would like to uh, quote uh, uh, the data from uh, the, the Asian Development Bank, uh, which also uh, shows that China's contribution to the economic growth of the Asian Pacific region uh, this year has reached uh, 64.2%. And it has contributed to 67.6 uh, of the growth uh, in trade in goods and 44.6 uh, of the growth in trade in services in the whole region. So, so it's very clear. I think China still remains uh, a uh, powerhouse uh, house of the regional economic growth, and I I believe it will, be, it will remain uh, so in the years and decades. While we're in the topic of uh, diversifying the supply chain, um, I want to go to the, the, the most recent APEC Leaders Summit in, in San Francisco. One of the key points that uh, uh, brought up was to, uh, cre in order to create a more sustainable economic region for Asia Pacific, was the focus on infrastructure and transportation networks. So, um, this question is, is for the panel. There's two things, one infrastructure and transportation network um, that is also promoting the use of electric vehicles across the region. Um, could one of you share an example of a certain country that built a good infrastructure that other countries could follow? Let's talk about the, 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 the region, the country that you're more uh, yeah. familiar yeah. with. So, of course, you see the kind of infrastructure that's being developed there. That I think uh, many places would, would benefit from that. So, high speed rail, uh, expansion into uh, looking at electric vehicles and autonomous vehicles, like experimentation. Uh, fantastic new direction around there. Maybe there's a two part of that. One is the movement of goods and supply chain, which is called uh, airport seaport, waterways. Uh, and the other one is the digital infrastructure that's enhancing the, the, the uh, training labor force and so forth. Um, maybe Ms. Hoon can talk on that topic first. Yeah, so uh, regarding to the digital infrastructure, um, I, 
I would like to talk about Vietnam and how we are doing at the moment. I've seen that uh, Vietnam uh, government has done a lot of uh, program uh, around these ones. So the first we have to say about the digital Asian cooperation program to work 2025. And now uh, we, um, the Ministry of Communication and, and, um, um, and like MIC already have planned to build um, about one million uh, digital skill workers that are the, the, uh, to work 2025. So I believe that is very, um, very good pro a program that we can have um, <coughs> to adapt with the market demand and uh, we need more digital workers. And also for the infrastructure, we use very good broadband network. We can see 4G and 5G everywhere in Vietnam now is very active. And, and Vietnam government also uh, build two um, innovation um, park, like a high-tech park, one in Hanoi and one in Ho Chi Minh City, which um, to, uh, to help startups, uh, technology companies, and ID Center to collaborate, to innovate, and they have a lot of incentive program um, to, um, to work on, on this program. And also the, the training for, for the book, um, book force here in Vietnam. So we can see many universities in Vietnam who um, buy an IT course now, and every year we have 50,000 graduate in IT, that is a very good um, starting point for, for the country to uh, prepare for, for the change of for restructuring um, the ship at the moment. If, if I can just add on to comments on transport. I, I believe that transport is one of the three keys that are critical for Asia's future success, in particular for ASEAN. And the three keys they uh, technology, tourism, and transport connectivity. ASEAN has developed already two master plans of connectivity that focuses on digital technology and physical technology, which is basically the transport infrastructure that needs to be built. And, and I think we also need to focus also on people connectivity to, to bring in tourism, education, and exchange. In terms of transport connectivity, ASEAN has developed a large number of major transport infrastructure projects, and a lot of that is part of China's BRI um, programs, the, the high-speed railways in Indonesia, uh, the, the East Coast Railway in Malaysia, the Laos, and uh, uh, Kunming Exchange, Rail Exchange is also symbolic of, of the commitment to developing transport infrastructure in ASEAN. I think that's key. That's very important for ASEAN's future competitiveness. And I think if you look at ASEAN's economic future, one also needs to take into account what are called the three eyes. And I think the three eyes apply to the whole of Asia as well. And that's a need to monitor interest rates, inflation, and infrastructure spending. Infrastructure spending will determine the future growth of the region and the monitoring of interest rates and inflation are also key challenges that we need to address. Yeah, I just want to uh, very quickly add on. Um, I absolutely agree with, uh, with uh, what you have just said. I think uh, infrastructure truly holds key. Um, and uh, and as, as we all know, that this year actually marks the 10th anniversary of the initiative that China proposed. Um, and, uh, um, and you mentioned the high, uh, high speed. Uh, in, in Asia. I actually just came back from a 10 day trip to Africa. So, China also helped you a Mombasa uh, and OB high uh, speed train uh, railway uh, in uh, uh, Kenya. And that is very uh, impressive uh, as well. So, if we, you know, if there's any recipes for China's uh, success story in the past 40 plus years of opening the form that we know, it is infrastructure. As many of you might have heard of this Chinese uh, saying, uh, it's come down and I'm sort of very familiar to a lot of uh, 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 friends and in the international community, which is if you wanted to get rich, to build the world first. So I think that's, uh, 
that's how I think Sun Mina really um, internalized into the Chinese mentality and understanding how in order uh, to promote economic robust economic growth infrastructure should be able to keep. So, so uh, that's why I think you know, the oppression I think is very important. I think uh, the region uh, uh, we have to be, I think, uh, to be fully committed to, uh, to really uh, 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 promoting, further promoting the infra infrastructure development. Uh, and that is also uh, part of, uh, in addition to BRI, uh, what China has been promoting, uh, the, the Asian infrastructure investment. Together with uh, many uh, partners uh, in the region world, uh, we are committed to. Just maybe just one thing on that. Um, I was at the APEC uh, summit in San Francisco uh, with the Vietnamese delegation, and obviously, since it's in the US, it's the by Biden administration, so all they talk about is economic, sustainable development in green. Uh, and so that was the main thing. Uh, and one key, just want to touch on two key issues. One is that uh, company needs to be prepared because by 2026, your manufacturing goods, if it's not uh, carbon neutral, you would have to pay a carbon tax, both of export to Europe and the US. And this is something that most companies don't understand and not prepare, and they should be. That brings me to the second topic, which is one of the key infrastructure that people don't talk about. I mean, we talk about Ford Road and it's on so great way. But one of the key infrastructure is going to be renewable capacity or renewable energy. Because without that, your export would not be competitive against countries that are focusing on renewable uh, energy. Uh, you won't pay a carbon tax. And at the moment, Vietnam is already in a space where we are now uh, planning to be triple our capacity by 2030 with solar and wind. I think government countries should be prepared for that. Otherwise, their company will not be able to so from an energy perspective, it's not just the amount. I think in the last two years, we've seen a lot of interest and, and um, Vietnam's economic growth has kind of slowed down this year. But is it stop loss from seeing a lot of interest from investors coming in to do uh, energy projects? Um, in, in your space, from an investment perspective, Vietnam and ASEAN, what does that big picture look like from an energy perspective? We get transition to right? From, from coal to clean to renewable energy. And this is a space where they will need a lot of money. And the biggest issue has always been financing, green financing, green bonds. People talking about it all the time, but it's just getting the money is difficult. So it's all about policy, government policy, and how they can help uh, a project bankable so that the financier can finance the project. The need is there. And I think at least Vietnam uh, did have a uh, commitment by 2050 to net zero uh, uh, commitment. So that's a major st step forward. The only issue now is we need the government to push forward on some of the fitting tariffs and the policy that's made the project available. I think the, the opportunity in investing in clean renewable energy in ASEAN, but especially in Vietnam, is, is very significant because, as the Prime Minister said, at one point, what does Vietnam have? We have two great resources. We have a lot of sunshine and a lot of wind along the coast. So those are the natural resources we should use. Can I also just add that energy transition, I believe, is the single biggest challenge that all of us face in Asia. In, in ASEAN, the ASEAN governments have adopted an ASEAN Green Deal that, that focuses on the green transformation and promoting green growth. And in many of the countries, we have already adopted an energy transition roadmap to, to see how countries can be moving forward in, in, in transitioning to green energy in particular. I think in ASEAN there's a lot of potential for solar energy and, and also in some of our countries, hydro is a, a good prospect as well as the, the transition to hydrogen, hydrogen energy. And I think these are challenges that needs to be looked at. And as Don has pointed out very clearly, there is a huge financing gap. And, and there is a need for long-term financing. And, and in this regard, we need to tap off the normal capital market and the Islamic capital market in terms of so good bonds, long-term so good bonds, that will be able to finance the green energy projects. I, I, I believe that the four 
biggest challenges facing us in Asia are what I would call the 4D challenges that increasing that countries and companies have to, to address the, the need for uh, decarbonization, uh, the energy transition, and for digitalization to transition into a, a digital economy, as well as on the deficits that many countries are facing. The 4D challenges would have a big impact on ASEAN's future competitiveness and needs to be prioritized. Energy is such a long-term game. This is, is long-term investment and uh, requires collaboration between the private and public sector. It doesn't happen tomorrow. But what we see today is, is going back to the, the global shift of, of supply chain. Like, there's an immediate and midterm need and demand that needs to be resolved from companies that are moving out of China to other countries. Trade-reliant countries such as Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, being some intermediary uh, uh, steps to, to, to mitigate these things. What, what are these countries supposed to be doing? And what are the biggest example of other countries have done so? Um, bridging, on, on, as the Don Lam just said, it, by 2026, you're not doing that, you're going to receive hefty corporate tax on, on uh, carbon neutral. Um, is there an example in the region that is a specific country that has done so quite well? Not so much. We need more money. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, the, in general, most countries are not prepared not yet. Uh, that's what it was brought up in APEC, that we are not ready. Uh, most companies don't really know there's going to be a, a carbon tax coming up in 2026. So, what of our role? Uh, I'm part of the, uh, the private sector advisory council uh, for the Prime Minister of Vietnam, and one of our key objective in 2024 is to educate uh, the public and educate the companies that they need to be ready uh, for this. But I don't think many countries in ASEAN is actually uh, prepared for it yet. This is mostly you know, European-driven policy, so sort of it goes back into our Asia and say, you got to do this, so we're not ready. Okay, well then, I guess the, the next obvious uh, 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 segue would be opportunity for investment. Well, this is the, the space that's a lot of opportunities, the place that uh, minor countries and companies are not prepared. So, um, which, which industry that we see would be a good uh, investment in that for a more sustainable future and also resolving some of the immediate issues? I would say for most of us in ASEAN, resource-based industries could be the way forward because that can provide an opportunity also for sustainable growth and then resource-based industry will facilitate the uh, transition to, to more efficient production in, in many of the countries in ASEAN from being just the producer of primary products into a more resource-efficient transition. Tourism, education, healthcare are some of the services industries that I think will show uh, good prospects in the other countries as well. So I just add something. The issue that I see in many countries, not just in Asia, but in many countries, where they're beginning to look for uh, new value added uh, products and services is that where they the educated workforce uh, to provide them that new direction. So it takes time, and they need to be able to uh, develop a strategy that then ties the education uh, to the kinds of direction that that workforce might be able to apply themselves to. And uh, many communities, whether it's in Asia or anywhere else, they're not looking at that specific strategy fast enough. Here and, and been done in 
realized that that was part of their strategy. Uh, they realized that in order to shift from agrarian to traditional manufacturing, they had to involve uh, academia. And I think that that was a very important, very specific direction that helped this community uh, move forward. And so you had these universities here, like the representatives from Eastern International University, they're the kinds of future that uh, I think is necessary to look at the economy for, for, for Vietnam, but also for Asia. And so that is a very important conversation. Yeah, very quickly. Oh, just two, two seconds. I just wanted to add on, echo um, uh, 
the idea of smart city. I think it's not just giving should be the whole right and how the city is run, designed about I should should be transitioned. Competition of uh, electrification of everything is overtaking the topic of smart cities and can put it in the back for many uh, uh, leaders in, in the public space. Um, let's go back to China. Let's say the big things that we never talked about was the whole real estate crisis in China and continue to worsen and it affecting the purchasing power and everything uh, shifting out of China. Uh, Japan's economy is not great. Uh, uh, South Korea focus, focusing on tech and innovation, and, and money is and valuation and stuff is kind of not doing great for the last two years. How are these three countries going to affect the rest of Asia in, in, in the next couple of years? Um, I think uh, there are always risks as our economy grows, right? So there's uh, no exception. Um, so I think for China, and you just, I think, noted that the very specific uh, challenges facing China, South Korea, and uh, Japanese economies. I think one thing is that uh, 
we need to just look more closely. So that's why I was so encouraged when the, the foreign ministers, right, of China, of South Korea, of Japan, that recently just met. And they are, uh, are very quickly, I think, when we are uh, head of leaders uh, of government of uh, the three uh, countries, uh, will uh, also uh, meet again. Uh, so I think despite all the geopolitical, right, uh, misgivings, uh, you know, uh, competitions, uh, there are still very fundamental forces I think, that sort of bind us together. Right? You see, now we interdependence. I think eventually, uh, I think uh, Japan, South Korea, China, and other regional countries, and, and, the, and the United States as well. To understand that there's no way, I mean, decoupling is not the, not the option, not the way to go. Right? So that's why Biden administration clearly declared that they are not uh, uh, in the one for uh, So. So now I think the challenge you face us uh, is really how to strike a balance between security and, and really um, development. Uh, and uh, there's a tendency from what I see, and, uh, and uh, the academic circles, policy circles, uh, community also have a lot of discussion about that, which is also about over securitization, uh, which will be detrimental really to um, the economic growth of uh, many. Countries, I, I think actually the whole uh, global economic world. So, so try how to avoid that. I think is is really important in trade areas, in investment. Uh, countries could easily say for security reasons, you know, I want to uh, set up a whole list of protection measures and therefore cutting off, right, setting up areas for trade, uh, etc. Uh, I think this is. Uh, I don't think I think uh, we have figured out. But I think that is really the, uh, a very important task I think we have to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to meet. Really. Yeah. On a question on China, we are still generally positive and optimistic on China. We note that the property sector in China is going through some difficulties, but we are also confident that the new National Finance Commission that President she has established and now chaired by Greenery. Jack would be able to help turn around the property sector in China. But more importantly for us in Southeast Asia, our investments from China are not so much from Chinese private enterprises or property companies, but we are more reliant on Chinese SOEs, the old enterprises that are investing in infrastructure, transport infrastructure, and power infrastructure in the region. And we still believe that China can play a big role in the development of Southeast Asia. With regard to Japan and Korea, we see the China plus one strategy as advantageous to our region that Japanese and Korean companies that want to diversify from the China and have a plus one uh, location, looking at Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, are uh, uh, opportunities for us in Southeast Asia. So, um, running out a little bit of time, but uh, maybe this question is on the host countries is Vietnam. Um, we, we didn't have a really good year this year. Uh, corporate bonds market, the, the real estate market, and dragged down a lot of services relating industry. Um, next year, projections, this year was about four point something in terms of economic growth, that's more lower than 8% last year. And next year, pointing to uh, uh, IMF projected to be 5.7, still low. Maybe I and then Ms. Vernon can comment on the rising industry that we're busy doing something. Uh, one energy will take time, but let's just talk about some other industry that will be exciting and that will drive more economic growth for Vietnam in the next two years. You know, um, in, in, um, this year, yes, we'll be less than 5% GDP growth, uh, but in house, our chief economists predicted between 6 and 6.5% 6 next year. Uh, GDP growth of Vietnam still pretty decent, pretty good, uh, and, and mainly is driven by uh, you know as uh, post COVID the U.S. Uh, the market is one of the biggest for Vietnam export, so the new inventory and basically the last uh, nine to twelve months just driving down the inventory level, and we can see a lot of manufacturing now starting to pick up again, uh, so manufacturing refilling those orders. 
So that's why we believe that next year the economic growth will be slightly higher because the reordering uh, mainly from the international market, uh, which benefit Vietnam. The second point is on the FDI. I think foreign direct investment is still continue to flow to Vietnam, uh, and, and that will have a significant impact on the growth. The third factor is Vietnam is pushing hard for infrastructure uh, development uh, disbursement which is very slow in the first half of this year. But we believe that will pick up uh, probably toward the end of this year and the next two or three quarter. And that's why we believe that economically, we have to grow about six, six and a half percent in 2024. Yeah, I really uh, agree with you that um, like many other countries, Vietnam, um, for Vietnam this year is very tough. And for the uh, for business like it, it's very really hard. But we, we also think uh, next year will be harder as well, even if we, uh, GDP is grow, but um, still have in many industries. And um, I believe that Vietnam need to, um, to do restructuring, a lot of restructuring at the moment. And um, we need to create more different value that we are doing at the moment. Um, like, uh, like we already have a very good infrastructure. Vietnam invests a lot in, um, in, uh, in the backbone for the whole country to develop and to get more investment into Vietnam. But um, regarding to, um, to the area that we are working now, I thought that um, uh, now is in the era for digital, digital world. If we can leverage that kind of digital literacy uh, or advantage, we can get um, a lot of uh, advantage grow for, for Vietnam, not, uh, not for low level costs. But uh, we need to invest from now for infrastructure, for like data center um, to help smart city, and for the um, talent workforce. Even we can see now many unemployed um, people, but we still lacking a few resources which we need to build from now to make sure that they can adapt to the new demand. And um, I, I can say that this is not what we want to do, but that the, the world demand. We cannot win if we stay still, and um, we need to to act um, with purpose um, uh, to, to make things happen. John, you want to add that? Uh, you know, you have an opportunity right now. I, mean, I, I come from a world where you take marketing and look for advantages. And right now, you have a wonderful best practice that you should be marketing all over the world and develop a strategy take that brand internationally and, and attract foreign investment and, and, and also uh, uh, you know, local and domestic uh, development around what's going on here. Uh, you know, Vietnam has now uh, achieved something that is, should not just be left at, at, on a shelf. Uh, you should take this recognition, develop the best practices that are going on here and attract the investment, uh, delegations, you know, these, these sorts of events, and, and, and bring the world to uh, Vietnam so they can finally see what's going on here. Uh, I have to admit, up until earlier this year, I, I had no knowledge of what was going on here. Our group obviously worked with Vietnam, but not in terms of kind of the details of what you're doing here. It's fantastic. Need to explore that opportunity globally to bring people here that will recognize what's going on. And marketing is a key and essential part of this. I can't, I can't stress it enough. Thank you, John. Um, as you can hear, there are a lot of things that are moving, and uh, all things points to the key sector, which is energy, as we clean renewable energy and for Southeast Asia. for. ASEAN region or manufacturing uh, reliant country that will be uh, following some of the best practices from Europe. But uh, there's nothing we can resolve in just an hour. But I hope you find this insightful for all the wonderful speakers here today. Thank you very much for joining us and I wish the conference much success. Thank you.